Well, welcome everybody. I appreciate your good turnout tonight. This is going to be a very, very informative, very important uh, webinar. I really appreciate it. Also, in the announcement area on our website, if you would click on the Student Resource Center, check out our new Student Lounge. It is a new social media platform that Steve has developed and put on our website. It's kind of like we have our own Facebook, but it's not called Facebook. It's called Student Lounge. Uh, it's a great place to, uh, to get information about the school, to uh, catch up with other students. And if you are a registered student with us, you are already registered in our Student Lounge. So uh, if you are an enrolled student, you're already in our registered in our Student Lounge. It operates very much like Facebook, but um, it's going to be a great place where we can gather and we can chat, we can get information, we can talk about classes coming up and all kinds of stuff happening. Check it out, Student Lounge on our website. Go to our website and then uh, click on Student uh, Resource Center. Look at the Student Lounge. It's really cool. All right, Steve. Uh, all right, well, you want to open this up in some prayer? Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, uh, for uh, what you're doing here. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would speak to us. Just open up our ears and our hearts to hear what you would have us hear and know what you want us to know tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, welcome everyone. We're going to, uh, Dr. Self and I are going to kind of uh, go back and forth here a little bit. So let's go ahead and get started onto the first um, topic. This is called Don't Say That. And there's two verses that we want to um, review. Uh, Proverbs 18:21. that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Right here, this is, whoops. Hold on a minute, our, our drawing tool got turned off somehow. In the power of the tongue. Words, words are in the power of the tongue. And another thing about what words are is that there's another scripture that tells us that the words, the things that you speak reveal what's in the heart. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, there's, a, there's a lot of cliches, common sayings, aphorisms, um, uh, slang. That's just part of everyday in and out language. And if you're not careful, you can inadvertently say things that have power or have meaning over your life. Dr. Self, you want to add anything to that? Well, I think the best thing to do is um, let's watch the video and then we can to go deeper uh, into that, you know, and, and I've always, I've always say this, I've always believed that uh, uh, as Christians, our words are, are, are spoken into the atmosphere and because they go into the atmosphere, they're very powerful. I believe our words give permission for the Holy Spirit to work on our behalf. And unfortunately, I believe our words can give permission for demons to work against us. So uh, I'd say just watch the video and get deeper into it. Okay, <laughs> the video is two things down. Let me let me just well, read this scripture. Keep it in your mind, and we'll get into the video. Uh, Matthew twelve, thirty three, thirty seven. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. All right, so I think that uh, we're ready to do the video. Let's go ahead and jump in and review the video. It's only about seven or eight minutes long. In this video, I'm going to share with you seven things that Christians just need to stop saying. That's coming up today on The Beat. Hey, my friend, welcome back to The Beat. My name is Alan Parr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, it's a pleasure. If you want a free ebook, click the link in the description box below. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing. Hit that little bell notification so you won't miss a beat. Okay, so the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, but I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. 
Now, obviously we have to take a look at the context here, but basically the principle is very clear. Jesus takes it very seriously in terms of the words that we actually speak. And so for a while now, I've been wanting to make this video because I'm listening to different Christians and they're using words and phrases that the world uses. And yet the Bible says that we should be in the world and not of the world. And so here are my top seven things that if you are saying these things, you probably want to try to use a different word or a different phrase. Phrase number one, well, I guess it was just karma. Now you may hear Christians actually using this phrase in a situation like, let's say somebody cheated on their spouse and then they went and remarried and then their new spouse cheats on them and they'll say, hey, you know what? Yeah, it was karma. He got what he deserved. Let me give you three problems with using the phrase karma. Number one, it has its roots and origin in Buddhist and Hindu religions. So if you are a Christian, why in the world would you want to reference reference anything that is related in any way, shape, or form to the Buddhist or Hindu religions. Number two, whenever we use the idea of karma, we're not even using it in the right way. The definition of karma is when you do something in this life that is either good or bad, and then because they believe in reincarnation, in the next life, it comes back on you in a positive or a negative way. We use karma to say you can do something in this life, and then later on in this life, it affects you. That's not even the proper use of the idea of karma. So if you don't believe in reincarnation, which we don't as Christians, then we shouldn't even be referencing karma anyway. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 9, 27 says, it is destined for a man to die once and after that face judgment. So according to this verse, the Bible does not teach reincarnation and therefore we should not be using the phrase karma. But the third problem in using this phrase karma is that it actually suggests that we get what we deserve, which is against what the Bible actually says. The Bible says that we do not get what we deserve. As a matter of fact, Psalm 103 says that God has not dealt with us according to what our sins deserve. It does not always work out that if you do good, that good is going to come back to you. Bad things do happen to good people. It does not always work out, thank God, that if you do something bad or sinful or evil, that it's going to always come back against you. God has grace. God has mercy. God has forgiveness. God has favor. And so this idea of karma seems to suggest that we as Christians can control our own destiny by doing good and good things will come to me. And if I do bad, then bad things will come to us. And this is just not what the Bible teaches. The second phrase that Christians need to stop saying is good luck. Now I know what you're saying. You're like, come on, bro, you splitting the hairs here. I say that all the time. It's no big deal. So we may hear somebody say this whenever a friend is going to an interview. We say, hey, good luck. I hope you get that interview. And I want you to just notice very carefully, how does that sound? As a Christian, ask yourself, do we need luck? Luck? to get this job? No. We need the favor of God poured out on us. We need the sovereignty of God in such a way that if this job is for me, then it will be for me. If it's not, then it's not. But we don't need luck. We don't need superstition. We don't need some sort of coincidental thing to happen. That's how the world sees things, right? We as believers should place our faith in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Romans 8:28 says, and God causes all things to work together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So the next time you are tempted to use the words good luck, you may want to rephrase it and say something like, may God bless you. Or if that sounds too spiritual for you, just say, hey, I wish you the best. The third phrase that Christians need to stop saying is anything like knocking on wood or fingers crossed or jinx or anything like this. All of these things seem to suggest the idea that if I do this, then something bad will happen. So man, you may hear somebody say, well, so far, my marriage is going well, knock on wood. Or so far, man, my job is really going well, God is blessing me, but knock on wood. So by me knocking on wood or crossing my fingers sends the idea that by me doing these things, I'm somehow able to fend off evil spirits or bad fortune that may have possibly come my way, but because I've knocked on wood or crossed my fingers, and therefore because I've done these things, then this bad fortune will not come to me. It also absolves 
me of my personal responsibility to improve my own situation and once again does not demonstrate complete and total faith in the sovereignty of God. Phrase number four is what's your sign? Now I hear a lot of Christians asking this question. Maybe they're dating somebody and maybe they're trying to think about whether they should date somebody and they say, you know what? I'm a Sagittarius. What are you? What's your sign? As if to suggest that by you knowing that person's sign, it's going to tell you everything that you need to know about that person. Listen, this is how the world operates. Listen, as Christians, we should not be looking into uh, signs and astrology and uh, thinking that we can predict something that's going to happen in somebody's life simply because of the month that they are born. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, it basically prohibits and condemns us looking at the signs for anything in terms of direction or whatnot. So if you are into horoscopes or any of these types of things, zodiac signs, as a believer, this type of behavior is condemned. Okay, phrase number five is one I've personally been guilty of, and that is to say, well, I'll be praying for you. Now, if you are really serious about praying for this person, like, you put down their name, you write down them, write their name down in your prayer journal or whatever, then you know what? This doesn't apply to you. But most of us, if we're honest about it, we use that to kind of escape the situation or, or escape the, the uh, conversation and get out of it and say, you know what? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be praying for you. But the reality is most of us do not actually go back and pray for that person or we have the intention of doing it, but we just simply forget. And in doing so, we're basically making a mockery out of prayer because we say we're going to pray for somebody and then for whatever reason we just fail to do it. So next time you say I'm going to be praying for you, either don't promise that you're going to be praying for them or actually commit to not just praying for them once to say you can they say that you prayed for them, but to actually commit to praying for them over a season of time if you truly do believe that prayer changes things. Number 6 is also along the same lines of prayer and that's when we say, "Well, let me pray about it." And that's that basically equals, I don't have the courage right now to tell you no to your face. And so instead, I'm going to be real spiritual and appeal to God and say, you know what? I need to pray about this before I give you an answer. And most of the times, whenever we say that, we already know the answer anyway. We just don't want to tell them what it is. Now, if you are once again committed to actually going back and praying about it to really seek God and figure out what direction he wants you to go, then by all means, that you should continue to do that. But if it is a situation where you're just simply trying to get out of the conversation because you don't want to answer that person's question, that you really want to think about whether you should use this phrase or not. In addition to that, if you are already in constant communication and prayer with God, you'll probably have an idea as to whether the opportunity that somebody is presenting you is in line with what God wants to do in your life anyway. And so there's a lot of situations where you may not need to pray for it because you've already pre-prayed prayed for it in the past. And so whenever opportunities come your way, you'll know that these things are from God. And the seventh one is, well, it's just not my place to judge. And you may hear somebody say this. Let's say you see somebody on the news, they just committed murder, or you got a friend and they just cheated on their spouse. And you say, well, you know what? It's not my place to judge. Yes, it is. The Bible says that we should make judgments about all sorts of things. We need to judge false teaching. We need to judge sin. One day the Bible says we are going to judge the angels. We are called to make judgments about things. As a matter of fact, that's the whole reason why we have a judicial system that God has implemented in the scriptures because we are called to make judgments about right and wrong, evil and righteousness. The key is not to just say, well, it's not my responsibility to judge, but to learn how to make the correct judgment and Jesus said before you judge someone else make sure that you look at yourself first get the log out of your own eyes so that you can see clearly enough to be able to get the speck out of your brother's eye so once again stop saying that it's not my place to judge it is your place to judge but we need to learn how to judge in the right way so everything that I've shared in this video is how the world communicates. They put their faith in luck, in coincidence, in karma, in fortune, in horoscopes, in zodiac signs, and all these different things. As believers, our faith, our ultimate faith and trust is in the sovereignty of God.
So the next time you find these words on the tip of your tongue and you're ready to voice them, you may want to think about saying something else so that our words will reflect our Christian faith and the character of God to the outside world. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe, check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Um, well, I, th I thought overall he, he made some very good points about, you know, things, things not to say. And, um, and I'm kind of a big picture guy. And so, you know, he, he talked about karma being related to uh, reincarnation. Obviously, you know, we're not uh, involved in that. But big picture is anything spiritual that has anything to do with the supernatural that's not about Jesus Christ, okay, and the Holy Spirit, okay, who, who is Jesus Christ, then that's forbidden by God. And, and you'll see this, uh, you know, when he talked about astrology and uh, all, all this kind of a good luck, we have to be very careful when we get involved in things that are, or, or talk about things or proclaim things that are spiritual that are not about the Holy Spirit and about God. When you look in the Bible, and this is kind of a big picture and overview here, we'll get to more detail. If we look throughout scripture, the number one thing that angered God so much that he wanted to wipe Israel out was when they went out after other gods. And so the fact that we want to play around with other spiritual things such as astrology, karma, um, you know, the, the new age, you know, mother nature, and all the vibes, the good the vibes, all this spiritual stuff that's not the Holy Spirit, we're angering God and we're also opening up demonic doors. So we can go more into that. He, he talked about um, good luck. I'll let Steve handle this one. He's got some really good good take on this one. Uh, for I mean, for most of my life, good luck was one of those things that it was a departing uh, uh, statement. It was, it was something you said to somebody just as you were leaving and you had your discussion and, and okay, well, good luck, you know, and as you part ways. And I never crossed my mind that good luck meant anything other than a, a, a common way to say goodbye until I had read Isaiah 65, 11, 12. And you know how this happens. You read something and then all of a sudden it jumps out and it's leaping at you. And, and it happened to me when I read this verse. But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, and who fills up or who fills cups with mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword. All right, so let's just take a look at that verse. To begin with, it's starting off and it's saying, if you participate or if you do these things, okay, there's a consequence for it. If the con, whoops, my drawing tools keep turning themselves off. All right, so you, for you who forsake the Lord and who forget my holy mountain, who set a table for fortune, and who, who fill the cups with mixed wine for destiny. It's like you're saying, if you do these four things, I will destiny you for the sword. So there's a consequence attached to doing these things. Uh, so what exactly, when I looked at this, two things leaped out at me, was that fortune was a proper noun, and so was destiny. And as I studied more on this, I've come to learn that fortune and destiny are two spirits. All right, destiny is a spirit that people believe uh, controls the outcome in their life. But is that in agreement with God's word? No. Doesn't God's word say that he know, knew, knows your steps before you were even born? The spirit of destiny has nothing to do with it. What about the spirit of fortune? Fortune is like the luck part. Right, the for the, the somebody who's believing in the spirit of fortune is expecting um, blessings and favor based upon the spirit. But aren't blessings and favor what we get through Jesus Christ? You see, both of these spirits are exactly opposite of what God has promised us. And so, what is it that you're actually doing here? Is that when you're saying good luck, you're 
speaking words that's wishing a condition upon somebody, a condition of fortune and a condition of destiny. And so it's a way that you are actually speaking the authority of these two dark spirits over someone else. Dr. Self? Dr. Self? Okay. I think you covered that very thoroughly. <laughs> Let's move on. Excellent. Uh, he, he talked about, uh, you know, knock on wood, uh, jinxed, uh, fingers crossed. And, you know, you don't want to get legalistic about it, but again, um, the whole thing was, you know, knock on wood will keep you from being jinxed, okay, uh, or bring you a, a blessing. You know, uh, fingers crossed means what is it? What is I? Uh, I can tell a, I can tell a lie, but if my fingers are crossed, it's okay. Um, you know, this kind of stuff. But it, it's silly. It sounds silly. It sounds, um, you know, you know, childish. However, we saw scriptures that talk about. And we'll be judged for every word that we speak. And so blessings and curses, we're going to talk about this in a little bit. Blessings and curses, well, we will say that, um, let me just read this scripture. By uh, James 3.10, from the same mouth come both blessings and curses. My brethren, these things, you know, should not be that way. So what I'm saying is, again, when we invoke something supernatural, even though we're doing it in a childish way, I really think it aggravates God. And I do think your problem, Steve sort of hit it really heavy there, is you're also giving permission to other spirits to act on your behalf. You hear me? Other spirits to act on your behalf. So moving on, um, you know, what is your sign? Well, that's getting into astrology. What is astrology? Astrology is the study of the stars, which is supposed to give your destiny and your fortune uh, and, and, and give the pr pr prophetic look of your life. I think astrology, as a matter of fact, uh, is very, very, very serious and very offensive to God. If you've ever been through any deliverance ministry, on every single deliverance minister that I know has a hit list. And if anybody who's ever been involved with astrology, uh, if they do not repent of that, ask forgiveness and repent of that, then they're opening up a door to demonic oppression. Um, and I've seen this 100% of the time. This is on the hit list. Uh, every minister will say, if you have practiced astrology, repent. Um, so it's, when we say, what's your sign? We are actually kind of getting into and agreeing with the, the occultic. Amen? So it's serious stuff. Steve, you want to make a comment on that? Or? Yeah, I have a comment take a look at the motivations of what's your sign. Uh, what you're really doing in astrology is attempting to obtain knowledge. You're seeking knowledge, right? So if you're studying astrology, you're looking at the astrological positions in order to determine what, in order to gain knowledge of a future event. So the objective to the astrology is gaining knowledge. What does the Bible tell us about gaining knowledge? The Bible tells us that all truth is discerned through the Holy Spirit, not through the Holy Spirit and the position of the astrological signs. And so when we participate in astrology, when we ask what's the sign, when we're seeking the knowledge, we are, in, we are ignoring not only what the Bible says, but we're in rebellion to what the Bible is telling us to do. Dr. So? Yeah, and, and again, um, he's right. We're, we're seeking knowledge, but if it is supernatural, and has a supernatural or spiritual element to it, then in that spirit, and if it's not the Holy Spirit or something that God commends us to do, it's going to be demonic in nature. Okay? It's going to be offensive to God. And when you do things like this, you're giving demons permission with your words to act, I, I will say, on your behalf. They're not going to act on your behalf. They're actually going to come in and do some damage to you. I don't want to give them permission. I don't want to invite demons into my life. And practicing this stuff, which is offensive to God, can cause that. that that's my, you know, call me uh, extreme, but uh, it's to me, it's, it's common sense. Stay away from supernatural, spiritual things that are not scriptural. Um, you know, I'll be praying for you, to me, uh, it's just... <laughs> Please forgive me, but most of the time, 
he'll help me. I'm going to be really gentle here, but it's kind of a lie <laughs> because it's, it's a cliche. I mean, now I know there are, are great Christians out there when they say, I'm going to be praying for you, Liz. Um, they actually do it, Sherry. Yeah, it's a lie. You know, they, they'll do it. But most of the time, it's almost like a farewell. All right, Steve, I'll be praying for you. All right, Jaleesa, I'll be praying for you. Okay, you know, I'll be praying for you. But you know, if we're not going to sit down, get quiet, and pray for that person, then we're being dishonest. Can you comment on that, Steve? Um, the late Derek Prince once said that, in his opinion, 99 out of 100 promised prayers are never delivered. And I, this came up in a, in a home group study one time. And one of the one of the uh, things that we had come up with was that instead of saying I'll be praying for you as if I'll do this at a later time, change it around and just say, can I pray for you as in right now? And so don't put it off. If you're really going to offer to pray for somebody, do it right there on the spot. Most people won't tell you no. Dr. Self? Dr. Self? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, my seminary professor at Memphis Bible College years ago taught me that thing. Um, you know, a friend calls you, they, they pour out their heart to you, and, and so many people say, oh, that's so terrible. I tell you what, you know, I'll be praying for you, okay? God bless you, I'll be praying for you. Well, my seminary professor said, kind of what Steve said, why don't just stop and pray right now? Let's pray right now. You know, let's just pray right now because I'll be praying for you so many times it just doesn't happen. But if you just stop and say, you know what, no procrastination, I'm going to pray right now, right now before you get off the phone. I think it's very wisdom. Uh, Connie says, I believe it's demonic influence to make these phrases sound trivial and inconsequential so that man will poo-poo the seemingly rigid Christ follower stance. Um, well, demonic, yeah, well, yeah, I could, well, a demon... Uh, Satan would want this to be trivial and would want it to be not because somebody would say, well, that's just a phrase. That's just good luck. It's just karma. It's no big deal. You know, I'm a Pisces or you an Aquarius, um, that kind of stuff. And so I think trivializing it would be actually helping the devil with his scheme. <laughs> Amen. All right. Um, I need to pray about it. And to me, that goes along with, with the previous one. Um, but that's more like, um, hey, uh, what do you think about getting together for lunch next week? Well, let, let me pray about it. Or, um, hey, would you would you like to work in the children's nursery next Sunday? I'll, I'll pray about it. Um, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. But what that means is I think the, the, the speaker said, you just don't have enough courage to tell them the truth. And so what does that mean? end up being it's a it's a lie <laughs> you know it, it's a it's an avoidance okay it's, it's a cop out in my opinion steve any comments on that one i think i've seen it used as an excuse to yeah, um, yeah. To get away from the topic and not have to deal with it right then yeah an excuse yeah <laughs> um let me pray about it it does i need to pray about it let me pray about it you know I've, I've seen something related to that. Uh, people will tell me, um, I just didn't feel led to do that. Um, and Well, I understand we should be led by the Spirit, and, and, and that's true. That's a commandment. You know, those who are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. We should be led by the Holy Spirit. But I see people sometimes tell me they're not led by the Spirit to do things that are clearly scriptural. Uh, I, I had a friend years ago who said, well, the Holy Spirit led me... Uh, told me not to go to church and not to be under any any church. I'm going, well, wait a minute, that's sort of, uh, it doesn't really sound like the Holy Spirit to me, you know. Uh, so the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict the Word of God anyway. Sort of similar to, I need to pray about it. All right, okay. Next, we're okay, Steve. Right there. Um, one of the issues I brought up in my book, Unchained and Undercover, is that God tells us to do certain things, and it's it's not a request. He's just saying, okay, here, I've equipped you, now go do these things. And once we have the directive to go out and do the things that he has, he has told us to do, 
We don't have to stop and say, hey, is it okay? Can I do it now? You already have permission. You have the equipping, you have the permission, you have the authority. Just step up and do it. Amen. 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 Um, not my place to judge. I really think the speaker did a great, uh, a great job on this. Now, the there's a scripture that says, judge not lest you be judged. And that is referring to false judgment. It's also referring to gossip and assumptions. Uh, and it's sort of an English language interpretation problem. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. And he talked a lot about, you know, recognizing a tree by the fruit, recognizing a Christian by the fruit. So if I see an apple on a tree, it's very scriptural for me to judge that that must be an apple tree. I'm in Florida. If I see an orange hanging from a tree, it's very scriptural for me to judge that that might be an orange tree. If I hear something that is unscriptural, and through the gift of discernment, I judge that that is not coming from God. That is very scriptural. Steve, any comments on that? Um, no, I mean, I agree. I think you hit it. Well, in judgment, it, you know, to be judgmental and to assume things without knowing the facts is forbidden, okay? It is also forbidden, and he mentioned this too, to be looking at the speck in somebody else's eye and not dealing with your own issues, you know, with the log in your eye. So, um, you know what? This is not in the Bible, but if it looks like a duck, <laughs> if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And I think that's the judgment Jesus is talking us to you. It's just wisdom, okay? All right. And you can use this, well, it's not my place to judge, as a cop-out. If something's clearly ungodly, clearly unscriptural, clearly grieving the spirit within you, then it is your place to judge that. You also have to be careful that that act of judging can be easily corrupted. Um, it's a place where pride can get in very easily. Um, so it, you have to use it with some, yeah. I guess with, with care. Would that be the right way to say it? Right yeah, yeah. The, it, the judgment and discernment can be very harsh um, and graceless and loveless if you're not careful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the, sound, the slides. Uh, in general, uh, Steve, this is what you put in there, right? What does my mean? I think this is a good, big, yeah, good point here. Three slides, Kerry. Well, you go ahead and take these? Yeah, go ahead and take some of those. I'll, I'll just interject in a minute. A question where I'm querying and asking people to type in some answers into the chat box. What does my mean? Uh, what's What does it mean? Right, we have a comment here from Ian. He says, um, uh, are we as Christians allowed to say he deserve, he deserve the death penalty once we have all the facts? We have all the facts. Well, uh, let me say this, there's no authority except that which is appointed by God. It says in Romans chapter 13, uh, verse 1, I believe. So if the judge, of the elected judge of the land has proclaimed um, and determined in the jury, has determined a death penalty, then yeah, okay. Um, but that's a tough, that's a tough question. But, you know, I would go along with the, with the ruling of the court because God appointed, you know, the authority that we have. That's all I'm saying. Um, I agree with uh, what Dr. Self said, and, and Ian, that's a, that's a kind of a deep question, but I'll have to point out that um, it's the whole reason that we needed our Savior because the, um, the wages of sin was death. Um, Liz says, so when we hear misinterpretation of the word, is that judging the man or their misinterpretation? Um, I tend to focus on judging the misinterpretation, okay? Now, if, if a person is, yeah, no, I think you need to, I think you need to be careful there. Uh, if, if a man teaches, uh, misinterprets a verse, I can judge that's a misinterpretation. But to, to assume 
that he's deliberately, he's the antichrist and he's a false prophet and a false teacher, that's getting into assumption. So we want to be careful with that. Let's go back to um, the slide on the screen. Uh, what does my mean? Uh, Denise uh, gave us an answer, says my belongs to me. Um, yes. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. But at its heart, my implies ownership. I mean, you think about what a child will say when it, it, it the child, I can, can't you hear it? You know, mine, 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 right? It's implying ownership. Now, what our words do is that we can imply ownership with our words. It's this pro, it's this, this ownership that can give spirits permission to work in your life. So there's different ways that we can own it. So here in example number one, it says, I'd go, but I have to get over my cold, okay? Now, there's nothing really wrong with this, but you'll notice that you're implying ownership of the cold, okay? Now, is that in agreement with God's word? Well, Jesus uh, took um, uh, infirmity to the cross, which is the physical illness, God's word says that by his stripes we are healed, and that in fact, as new creations in Christ, illness is no longer ours. All right? It's been given to him, and we've received his, his health and his healing through the divine exchange. That means it, we don't own it anymore. It's not ours. And yet, even this very simple little sentence, we are proclaiming ownership over the issue of illness. Can you see where the conflict is with God's word there? Again, here we have another one that goes, it's my problem. Not a big deal. We always have all kinds of problems, and if you don't want somebody else to help you with it, sometimes you might come back and say, don't worry about it. It's my problem. I'll deal with it. Except that, once again, you are proclaiming ownership over something. Um, who Can anyone think of a verse that actually states the opposite, that it wouldn't be your problem? Is there anything in God's word that's, that by saying it's my problem could actually be in conflict with? Can anyone think of something like that? It's This is when you type into the chat box. Cast your cares upon me. Thank you, Liz. Very good. How about um, uh, the burden is light? Okay. So there are scriptures that claiming that it's your problem, you could be in conflict with that. All right. How, now let's, go, let's look at the next one here. Um, I'll never figure this out. Okay. I'll never figure this out. Now this, this talks a little bit about a future event because it means that not only can you not figure it out now, but you can never, you'll never get it figured out in the future. Okay? And we're going to talk a little bit more about the present condition and the future condition in just a moment. But when you speak a word that says a condition that it carries forward into the future, you can very well be call, um, 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 speaking a word curse over yourself. You could also be uh, speaking a condition that is an agreement with a spirit, and it would allow the spirit to work in your life. The last one that we have in ex um, there is, I can't do that. Again, um, that what what is the essence of that? Is that I can't do that? Is an ad is a an admission of failure, or it is is proclaiming the ownership of failure, not success? But doesn't God's word says all things are possible through Christ, who are called according to His purpose? That means all things. You can do all things. All right. Dr. Self has given me the fi um, the sideways finger. <laughs> and I got comments over here. Um, let's see. Liz said, cast your cares on me. Um, and we have ca cast your cares on me. Okay, we got that. Uh, let's see. Liz said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Exactly. All right. Uh, and Connie says, both of the last two are essentially faithless. A very good point. Very good point. Good observation there. Um, yes, both of them are. If you feel that you can't do that, and you, that it feels like you're going to have, you're going to fail, 
um, yeah, you're lacking in faith with that. Dr. Self, do you have any comments on this before we go to the next slide? Before we go to the next slide. I think, um, you know, I've, um, I've struggled in ministry. I've noticed that people I pray for who own diseases and say, you know, the doctor said and, and that I will always have this. Uh, that, and then I, this is my disease. This is my illness. This is my problem. But see, the Lord says, Jesus took this. He took disease to the cross. Doesn't it really belong to Jesus? He took shame, condemnation, poverty, curses. Doesn't, doesn't all these stuff really belong to Jesus to begin with? So am I taking ownership of things that Jesus died for? Well, I don't think that's going to be pleasing to God. And, and I think, again, uh, you've heard the expression of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, when, you, when you speak these words out that this is my illness, this is uh, my thing. For instance, um, um, I, I know someone very, very close to me who says, um, I can never remember things unless I write them down. I, I never remember things unless I write them down. I'm going, well, the reason you can never remember things is because you continually say you can never remember things. And so my point is, words are powerful. The Bible talks about blessings and curses coming out of the same mouth. Words are powerful. And, and in our words, we take ownership of things. Well, this is my cold. This is my illness. This is my disease. Well, no, it's, I mean, you have it. It's on you. It's afflicting you. You're hurt. You're sick. Yeah, that's true. You're sick. But the disease doesn't belong to you. It belongs to Christ. That's my take on it. So, let's go ahead and go on. I think we're at the last slide here. So we got one more. One more oh, slide. Okay. This one. All right, so this is an area where you it, there, there's some room for some confusion. I just put this in here to, to make to, to clarify a few points that there actually is a difference between stating a fact and proclaiming a condition. Okay, um, the, we I am I'm talking in a webinar right now. All right, it's just a simple fact. That's what's happening. There isn't it doesn't imply anything beyond the fact that it's just happening. If I if I had a cold and I simply said I have a cold, okay, I'm not saying that I own it, but I'm simply stating the fact that it's here, okay. In fact, if you did have a cold and you denied it, you're just kind of denying what is there. But if you walk into a hospital thinking that, oh, there's sick people here and I'm going to catch a cold, and you're saying this before you actually have it, now you're, you're using those powerful words, the words that have the power of life and death, as a way to state that you have a future condition. Okay, and that's the act of proclaiming. Let's look at the next example. I haven't figured this out yet. There's actually nothing wrong with that. And especially yet, it actually shows um, um, an expectation of solving the problem. Maybe it's a puzzle, maybe it's a, a, a mathematical equation, whatever the case may be. And I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, it has to do with the present tense, and there's nothing, it doesn't mean anything beyond that. But if you turn around and say, I'll never figure this out, you're, ma you're speaking words that define a future condition. It's not that I'm not going to figure it out now, but never. Moving forward, I am never going to find the, con the uh, solution. I'll never figure it out. And that's proclaiming the condition. That's the power of the spoken word. Something like this could trigger a curse. This could be a word curse. All right? Dr. Self, you want to have, uh, add something yeah, to that? Um, yeah. Um, Jason, uh, Jason says, I often hear it's hereditary. Um, yeah. You know, the people, people will say that. But in a positive sense, you remember the old um, story of the train that said, uh, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and was able to pull this huge load up the mountain? And I've often said, what if the little train had said, I don't think I can. 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 I don't think the train would have made it up the hill. Right. And that's what we do with, with ourselves. Um, our words are powerful, and we need to start proclaiming truth, God's word over our children, over our lives, and proclaiming God's blessing, and proclaiming, you know, God's uh, what, what God says. 
and, and speaking that out and proclaiming it, it's very, very, very powerful. Now, I'm not saying get weird. Um, for instance, I, years ago, a, a story I tell is um, a lady came over to my house with her husband, and she said, oh, please pray for my knee. My knee is really hurt, and I'm in terrible pain. Please pray for my knee. I said, sure, I'd be glad to pray for your knee. And her husband said, don't say that. Don't don't say your knee is hurt because it's not hurt. It's healed. I'm going, no, 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 no. The fact is her knee was hurt. The truth is I'm going to proclaim God's healing over her knee. Do, do, do you understand? So you don't want to get where you're not being honest. The fact is you have a cold. The truth is you can proclaim that, hey, but by his stripes, I am healed. Um, and I've heard people say, you know, uh, every September, I always get bronchitis. Um, this always happens to me. I think we've got to be careful with these things. Um, yeah, it's fact. You know, it's, it's there's facts and there's God's truth. And why don't we start proclaiming the truth instead of owning the problem? I think maybe that's a good way to summarize it. Proclaim the truth instead of taking ownership of the problem. Any comments, Steve? Yeah, just a little testimony. I mean, I I don't take ownership of anything like that when I when I encounter that same situation. Um, a year ago, January, um, I got a report back from the hospital that I was a type 2 diabetic. My blood sugar was 530, and they were telling me I had to get to the emergency room immediately or I could die. Well, it didn't ring true in my spirit, and the first thing that entered my mind is, no, that's not mine. Why? Because Jesus took infirmity to the cross by his stripes we were healed. Right from the very beginning, I just knew it. I knew it in my spirit. That's not mine. I am not accepting that. All right, so here it is a year and a half later. You want to know what I have? My, my blood sugars are like in 90, right? Losing weight. Everything is perfect. Uh, my, my numbers are so perfect, they can't even see a sign of the type 2 diabetes. And I never accepted it. There's power in the words. Dr. Self? Dr. Self? You know, I just, uh, you know, I just agree. I agree with that. And, and, you know, I'm not saying don't pay attention to the doctors, okay? We should. God gives doctors wisdom. and He, he, he gave them the gifts that they have. But I'm also saying proclaim truth, okay? Proclaim truth. Um, you know, this is, stop proclaiming this is my poverty. I am poor. I am, um, I'm always struggling. Uh, I, I always, I never seem to make it. Uh, I, I'm just not that smart. Those to me are word curses, okay? And Lord, that's just an example, okay? Those are word curses, I mean. Liz says, of course, that's in the book of Job. You shall decree a thing. It's an excellent class. It teaches more about the power of our words. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good class in, on our website. Check out our website. Check out our classes. We'd love to have you. All right. Um, anything else, Steve? This whole um, hot topic discussion is about what not to say, but just to bring a positive spin on everything, um, what you should say, just continuously repeat God's word over your, over your um, in your life. If you feel like you can't do it, you know you know what I can do that. Stop listening to the negative. I do it all the time. I can do that. I do believe this. I don't. I I don't receive an illness. And you speak these things aloud because they're the power of life and death is in the words, is in the tongue. Doctor Self. Doctor Self. Amen. You know I I agree. Um, I think just. Um, don't walk around, you know, rule oriented and get all bound up with this. You know, relax. You know, you know, you know, cast your cares upon the Lord. His burden is easy. His yoke is light. The Holy Spirit, you shall live, be led forth by peace. Amen. I come to give you life, give it to you more abundantly. But let's just stop taking ownership um, of of curses with our words, and also, you know, be careful with with the words that give. Um, that have spiritual meaning that are not biblical karma and astrology and all, all that kind of stuff. I think we can set ourselves up for trouble. Amen. Uh, Liz has a question. How would you answer 
Well, Connie above that says, power in words, power in healthy lifestyle. Daniel spoke about healthy foods versus poor and rich foods. The Egyptians ate. That's true. Uh, Liz says, how would you answer someone who says it was destiny because God allowed it? Um, well, I don't believe that foreknowledge is always God's will. And that gets into the predestination question. Did God know something was going to happen? Yes, because he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's beyond time. But just because God knows something uh, and God uh, allows something doesn't mean it's his will. The, I believe God has given man a free will. We're free to sin. We're free to not sin. We're free to praise. We're free not to praise. We're free to obey. We're free to rebel. And there's where all the problems come in. But we're also free to love and worship. So um, it was destiny because God allowed it. If it's in the negative sense, I would, uh, you know, I would, I would question that with them. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. All right. Well, Steve, anything else? Um, no. Do we have any final comments or questions before we close up? Oh yeah. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, yeah. Okay, thank you, friend. Thank you on that. I yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you, Denise. Thank you so much. Amen. I'm going to come see you all before long. Amen. All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the power of words. And we thank you, Father, that you can put your words in our mouth, Father. So, Lord, let our words be pleasing to you. Let our actions be pleasing to you. Forgive us, Father, for speaking in agreement with the enemy. And Lord, we just purpose tonight, in the name of Jesus Christ, to speak in agreement with you from this day forward. Help us with that, Father. Remind us, Holy Spirit, to speak in agreement with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. Amen. All right. Okay. Uh, yes, it is recorded. It'll be up on YouTube, uh, Linda. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, folks, it's a good evening. Appreciate all of you being with us. And as we always say, good night, John Boy. Good night, Jim Bob. Good night, Mary Lou. Good night, Grandpa. Good night, Grandma. Good night, America.